relevance. <laughs> um, although that doesn't stop people normally. Can you speak to how, um, with the business opportunities that are rising coming, how that will also shift public opinion, where as marriage equality, I don't think, had a, quite the same boost. So how does that pertain just to the cannabis business industry? That's a great question. Um, the marriage equality did have a little of that in it because basically people would say that they calculated the state would get a certain amount of new revenue from tourism, from people going to Massachusetts to get married, and that was one fiscal argument. But actually you're right. I mean, one of the things I left out in, 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 in the talk is obviously the fiscal and business argument about this, which is that why, given that this is so widespread, why are we not, why is capitalism not working here? Why are profits not being made and why are taxes being levied? You know, when you look back at the end of alcohol prohibition, uh, that was one of the critical reasons. People, states, cities needed the money. Uh, and obviously we live in an age of some great austerity in many respects. And the potential to make the argument to people, hey, this will actually make us all better off, will actually raise huge amounts of revenues, that's definitely a factor that I, I, I probably should have mentioned. But, uh, but at the same time, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the real reason for this. I think, I think, I think the real reason for this is much deeper than that. I think it's fantastic that we can use that pragmatic economic argument to say, look. The government's going to get richer. Why are we letting criminals get all the profits from this when the society can get a profit from it as well? But I think the, the deeper argument is that there's no reason for this to be illegal in the first place, that it can make society better. That's another thing I wanted to say. Uh, there comes a point in any movement like this in which instead of saying this won't harm anybody, we'll raise money, leave us alone. There comes a moment when you say, this does good. This will make America better. Cannabis is good. To speak actually about the positive aspects of how it enriches people's lives, of how it enables people's creativity, how it can enable you to be, to be less stricken with insomnia. These are things, or, or, or not sure the other things, but how actually it can be part of a creative and phenomenally important uh, uh, movement in American society that it can, that can buttress and is behind already some of the most creative, energized, and productive people in America. We just don't know it, but they do. Um, and I don't know how many CEOs I met at Burning Man this year, but um, quite a few. And not many of them were prohibitionists, let me put it that way. So yeah, I think the business angle and the fiscal angle is kind of critical and a good, a good way to engage people who, who just feel uncomfortable talking about the other issue. Just say, well, what a, even if you feel uncomfortable about it, surely you'll admit that we get more taxes for, for schools or, or hospitals or whatever we want to Appreciate your uh, insights and passion, especially in the healthcare arena. Uh, I find it incredibly, uh, I don't know what, what the word is about the change in the scheduling for opioids. That's happening right now, you know, it was uh, oxycodone, tramadol, things like that. They're increasing the schedule, meaning more tight controls, which those are drugs of concern currently and have been. So I'd like to get your opinion on the timing, the leveraging, trading that as an emphasis which should be versus cannabis, things like that, for opportunities to show uh, more sanity. I think you probably know this man, David Nutt in England, um, and other important science researchers on this. I think, I think the answer to any of those questions is, show us the science. Just show us the science. Show us the studies. Show us what really works. Um, show us what's dangerous. Show us, shows us what hurts people. Show us what can help people. And that, that, 
This, is, this should not be a question of ideology. It shouldn't be a question of feelings. It should be a question of empirical data. Um, and I think it's also useful to say, look, uh, this is also what we do with marriage equality, is that we're focusing on cannabis because we think the arguments for that are absolutely integral. It is, it is an independent, utterly separate issue that you can campaign on. And the, the notion that this is a slippery slope and somehow the, the ideology behind it leads to the legalization of all sorts of other things that people are more crazy about is not the case. Because we're basing this on the science, and we need more science, and that's the other, other reason we need much more research into this, and that the classification of it is preventing incredibly important medical research. Uh, so I think the arguments of this are so much stronger empirically and sensibly than they would be than if they were portrayed as some sort of ideological movement to end all prohibition of all substances. Even though I completely respect that position, and I think it has a, 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 a certainly a distinguished intellectual tradition, and I'm open-minded about it, um, I don't think that's the core argument here. The core argument, as I said, is what's true and what's false, what helps and what harms, and what do we know, and, and, and we need to know more. So I think that's another argument, is that, is that look, we've discovered to an extraordinary extent how potent this can be in treating certain symptoms, but we have, the number out of research you've had into this is minuscule compared to what other much more esoteric, much more manufactured, much more toxic uh, possible drugs. Why would we not, as human beings, look at things that naturally occur in the world to see what they can do to help us, rather than arrogantly attempt to believe that we can create compounds of pharmaceuticals that will somehow be better than that. I think start from basics. Figure out this is an amazing thing and what it can do. I, I, I'm, a, I'm really bullish about that, I have to say. I, I, I kind of think that the, the cannabis in, in its various forms, um, various strains, and various mixes between uh, CBD and THC, is incredibly malleable, plastic, adaptable, variable thing. And we don't even know quite what it could do. We don't know how the actual experience of it could be altered dramatically. We already know the differences between sativa and indica strains. We, we already know what, or, or the, 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 the heavy CBD version that my friend is giving his son is not making his son high at all. In other words, there is an amazing opportunity to expand this into a variety of different forms for a variety of different reasons, for a variety of different ailments and a variety of different experiences. Uh, I know I sound a little bit like a, a sort of uh, mystic about this, but um, I don't see why this should, cannabis shouldn't be the fundamental, least harmful way in which human beings in our world experience a little relief from the ordeal of consciousness. <laughs>
so we kind of accepted the principle. Um, and I think I think this is I think I think at some point we have to open a debate a little bit of talk about that as well and, and say, look, come on. Uh, it's a balance. It's a balance. Um, and there is a responsive balance. And look, if people don't seek it this way, they seek it in other ways. They seek it in fundamentalist religion as a way to give to cope with the, the pressures of life, the full certainty about a certain thing rather than genuine religious faith. You see it in people clinging to ideologies, or people becoming workaholics, people whose lives are unbalanced and not as happy as they should be. I mean, it's staggering, really, when you look at America and you see a certain baseline level of wealth that is still surpasses the vast majority of humanity, and yet so much unhappiness and stress. And, and, and to some extent, I think the next generation, born in an era of austerity and stress, understand this balance more than the rather pampered baby boomer generation that had everything <laughs> and, uh, and made mistakes. Andrew, it's such a delight to be introduced to your intellect, and I'm looking forward to signing up for your blog. Thank you. It's also nice to be introduced to your heart. And I think that you may be a progressive in conservatives' clothing. <laughs> and my question is, uh, you know, along with the individual liberties of a conservative, how do you square that with the social safety net? Um, I'm in favor of a basic social safety net. Um, I believe in universal health insurance, for example. I'm an English Tory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if, 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 if what Margaret Thatcher presided over in England, the National Health Service were offered here, she'd be regarded as a communist. <laughs> so I believe in that. Um, and I'm also a conservative in the sense that I actually do believe that bigger government and more invasive government can do great damage as well as occasionally doing good. And I'm a skeptic. About those things, I'm much more inclined to rely upon individual freedom and local freedom and small government and, and local government to achieve the ends of society. Um, when you mention my heart, as if conservatives have, can have no hearts, <laughs> uh, I would simply argue that, yes, I, I think there are some conservatives who are, seem to have hardened their hearts to a lot of people, uh, to dismiss people as stereotypes. Um, and I also, unfortunately, know a lot of Christians who do the same thing. And I couldn't also, this is another thing in which I'm a little bit of a parish of one, I'm also a believing Christian, and I believe in our fundamental duty to love one another as best we can. And, and that means when I see suffering, when I see a person suffering unnecessarily, I have, a, I have an obligation, an instinct, to end it if I can, if it's possible, if it makes sense, if it doesn't lead to worse things. You know, all, you know, I'm not, it's not absolute, but it's relative. And so for me, there's no contradiction here. 